Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of you, wherever you are in any continent and all the ships at sea. I'd like to welcome you all this morning um, to our uh, exciting event here uh, at the, um, hosted by the uh, Center for Contemporary India at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Center of Contemporary India, is a, an element housed within our larger Institute for South Asian Studies. And CCI serves as a hub for research and other activities focused on the politics, economy, and society of India. We engage campus actors across disciplines and ranks from undergraduates to faculty. The CCI brings to Berkeley leading researchers and public actors engaged in work relevant to contemporary India. So today's event um, features a, a very uh, interesting and distinguished scholar, Mr. Amit Ranjan, uh, and I'll get to that in a moment, but uh, just give me a, a brief run through of the event. Uh, uh, Dr. Ranjan will uh, begin his talk uh, in a few minutes, uh, and um, those of you who wish to uh, ask a question during the uh, proceeding for discussion afterwards, please do so through the Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen. Uh, do not uh, raise your hand or any of the other uh, wonderful techniques that are uh, open to you. So I would like right now to introduce Dr. Ranjan and invite him to the quote stage and uh, uh, ask him to unmute himself and uh, Turn on his video, if you would, Amita, and uh, we'll get started uh, thank here. You. And it's it's uh, my great pleasure uh, and honor to introduce Dr. Uh, Amit Ranjan, currently a uh, fellow at the uh, Institute for International Studies at University at Florida International University. Dr. Ranjan has a as a scholar as a poet, as a short story writer, uh, an amazing, actually, uh, career, uh, which I can uh, run through only very briefly in the time we have here, uh, the short uh, form of which is that, let me see, I have all my paperwork in front of me. Uh, he's a Fulbright Scholar in Residence, Fellow in the Department of Religious Studies at Florida International University. This is undergraduate studies at St. Stephen's College uh, at the University of Delhi. Uh, as well as an MA, MPhil, and PhD from JNU in Delhi. He was visiting uh, fellow at the University of New South Wales in Sydney and a Fulbright Scholar in Residence at Miami. Um, his poetry collection, Find Me, Leonard Cohen, I'm Almost 30, came out two years ago, and the biography of Dara Shiko is due out soon, a very interesting figure from uh, Indian history. He's a lecturer of, at English at the NSERC in, uh, in Delhi and has taught at many of the colleges uh, at the university, including St. Stephen's and Miranda House. Um, today, he's going to talk to us on a very interesting and unusual uh, subject, one of which I know nothing about and have never heard much about. Excuse me for a moment. Which has to do with a very interesting sounding a person, uh, an Australian in India in the 19th century. And uh, we're all very eager to uh, learn about this uh, figure who seemed to have a very remarkable career here. And I will uh, leave it to Dr. Ranjan to uh, introduce the topic of his talk today and we'll get started with today's event. So please, uh, Dr. Ranjan, please, uh, we can begin. Um. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Um, Goldman and um, Dr. Panita, uh, <clears throat> University of California, Berkeley, for having invi invited me for this talk and, and to Fulbright program also um, for connecting us and facilitating uh, uh, this, this talk. It's, it's, um, <clears throat> it's really an um, honor to, um, to participate um, here today. And <clears throat> I'll be talking about my uh, latest book, um, John Lang, uh, Wanderer of Hindustan, Slanderer in Hindustani, Lawyer for, for the Rani. 
Um, so that's the book, John Dang. Um, and its subtitle, Wanderer of Hindustan, Slander in Hindustani, Lawyer uh, for the Rani. So John Lang is this very um, curious figure from um, the mid-19th century uh, who lived in uh, India between the years 1842 to 1864, and he died in India, in, in Masuri in 1864. Um, he was an Australian. Um, uh, Australia was not a uh, nation state, uh, then it became a country only in um, 1900, but he was born in 1816 and came to India in 1842 after having studied law at Middle Temple in England. So he's a very curious figure um, who was uh, pretty much uh, lost to history uh, for a good 100 years. And we shall look at why um, that happened too. A curious figure because um, uh, he, has, he had multiple careers um, as a lawyer, as a journalist, and as a novelist, and he was ambitious in, in all his three careers. None of those were uh, sort of uh, side careers for him. But uh, before I begin uh, about Lang himself, I'd like to talk a little about uh, how I stumbled upon him. Uh, how he was my um, uh, serendipity that that's, uh, sort of dragged uh, a decade and more. So I was um, actually looking for something else, I stumbled upon a grave of a, a, a girl called Alice Richmond, who had died in Pune. And her grave is in Pune University lawns, which happened to be the governor's house uh, during the colonial time. And so it's a lone grave on a university campus. So there are all kinds of uh, myths floating around that she was in love with an uh, Indian guy, and they both committed suicide over unrequited love. Um, that her ghost haunts the campus in white robes, much uh, like in Bollywood fashion, etc. <clears throat> um, and the epitaph on the grave itself, uh, which uh, says Alice Richmond born Melrose 1856, died January 14, 1882, died of cholera, etc. Um, I, I read something else on the grave which, which really piqued my interest, which was uh, died at this spot and is buried at this very spot. For a year, I tried to find out uh, more about Alice Richmond, but um, um, didn't hit upon anything. It was only a year later when I chanced upon a cyclopedia of Australian poetry, 1788 to 1888, in which there was this poem uh, on the death of Alice Richmond, died at Pune. So it was very clear that it's about her. There was no ambiguity. And then I knew something could be found about her. The poem was by Margaret Thomas, arguably the first Australian-born sculptor, etc. But during that year, and so the Alice story itself is very fascinating and has taken me to lots of places and lots of adventures and um, uh, very interesting ones, including to her village in South Australia, in Melrose, etc. But during that year, when I was trying to find out stuff about her um, and could not, I decided to uh, look up what Australians were doing in India and um, had to process vast amounts of material to, to figure out what the Australia-India connection was during the colonial time. And very interesting things came out, for example, uh, that the Australian girls were wild, so to say. They were the cowboys um, of the Southern Territory of Australia. And so they had to be sent back to England uh, to be coached to become good vibes as, as the socio-somatic snobbery of that time um, went on in the Victorian age. And very interesting things would happen. They would run off in Colombo or Bombay um, with princes in India or other people. And so that's that's a whole uh, different story altogether. But there was also South Asian Baptist mission in which these, these girls were sent. And uh, they were allowed to interact only with women, obviously, um, in India. And suddenly in East Bengal, what is now East Bengal, Bangladesh, um, women started learning English. And, and therefore you see Rokia Khatun's Sultana's Dream of um, a Feminist Utopia from 105, um, of which, in which uh, men have, uh, <clears throat> have retreated and given the power to women. And women work only two hours instead of eight because men used to waste time smoking and gossiping and, and so on and so forth. So what I'm just trying to suggest is uh, 
that the Australia India connection during mid 19th century is is very interesting and uh, led to profound changes in the in, in both the societies the camels in Australia are all wild camels uh, now Australia has the largest population of feral camels they're all imported from India they returned the camel drivers but the camels of course prospered in the Australian desert and and so on so there's there's this huge impact <clears throat> on both sides and in the process of trying to find out things about Alice, I also stumbled upon John Lang. And uh, when I saw that this uh, uh, Australian person, a white person is fighting against British imperialism, uh, it was very interesting. So he was tireless in his pursuit of fighting the British empire. The reasons of which are um, fairly obvious um, when we go to the context. It's, it's, it seems um, rather odd to a modern audience thinking that, oh, well, America and Australia were um, semi-colonies, let's say, of, of, of Britain. And therefore, uh, a white person from, uh, and, and that to a wealthy person from the colonies, why would they have an axe to grind against the empire? But Australia, having been founded by convict labor, so to say, um, the caste system, and I, I use the word caste instead of class here because uh, because Lang's family was rich, um, between the free people and the descendants of the convicts, uh, there was a difference um, in terms of their um, rights, their citizenry, and Lang was of convict origin. His grandmother and grandfather um, were from the first fleet. Um, his father was a wealthy sailor, and his father died before he was born. And so he was a currency lad or an emancipist fighting for uh, the rights of people from convict origin. So he studied law at Middle Temple in England, went back to Australia to practice as a lawyer, um, said some outrageous things. He was already an outrageous character in England when he was studying, as we see from his novels and, and various letters that his, his uh, one particular friend wrote to um, his father back home. Um, and what Australians called uh, larrikin, <clears throat> an irreverent, outrageous sort of a character. It's, it's a word uh, difficult to um, um, say translate into another idiom. Um, <clears throat> but Lang was this larrikin character. And so uh, he went back to Australia and overshot uh, the mandate that his then boss gave him. And um, he started speaking about Australia's freedom and freedom for the emancipists and so on and so forth. It was too early in early 1840s to talk about these things. And uh, he was frustrated because uh, he didn't meet with much success. His brother-in-law, um, and it's interesting that um, he got married in England having broken his leg on a hunting expedition and uh, fell in love with the host's daughter and, and got married and, and so on. So his brother-in-law was um, judge in, uh, um, in the Calcutta, uh, in, in Calcutta. And so he uh, decided to try and come to India and, and try his luck. So by this time he was married with uh, three kids. Uh, he was 26 and uh, he came to India to uh, beginning in Calcutta and started uh, this newspaper called the Mufasilite, which later he moved to Agra and Meerut and uh, it's very interesting that the newspaper is called Mufasilite. Mufasil means small town, and he wanted to be a small towner, not a big city man in, in Calcutta. So he left Calcutta and moved um, to the upper provinces, uh, and which shows his contrarian nature um, <clears throat> right from the beginning. And so being an emancipist and a currency lad, and he had a tremendous rage against the British gentry. So he would call himself a gentleman in all his novels or in Esquire, um, but he took on the might of the British Empire through all the uh, careers that he had. So <clears throat> the three careers that he had, one is a, sorry, <clears throat> lawyer, he would fight case um, mostly of Indians. Um, I could go on to say even only of Indians, but uh, um, I haven't uh, read all the 20 years of his uh, newspaper. 
I have a fair sense of them. As far as, as I can see, most of his cases were of Indians against the um, East India Company. And he stopped, mostly stopped practicing as a lawyer after um, the first uh, 10 years in India. And then he wanted to further his literary career. So he went to England, spent a good five years there. Um, as a, he's a close friend of Charles Dickens, of Wilkie Collins, and he had proper literary ambitions. And in his day, language was very popular, um, both in uh, England and in India. And it's only um, after his, his demise that the critics didn't take him seriously. And of course, it takes a critics, uh, it, it takes critics for afterlife um, of a literary um, author. We'll, we'll get back to that as well. And um, um, his, his third career as a journalist, um, he ran, like I said, newspaper Mufisalite for a brief while from Calcutta, uh, actually two times from Calcutta, and, and for the rest of the time from uh, um, Meerut and Agra. And um, um, so let's begin by talking about his uh, journalistic career, and then we'll move on to the other two and, and then try to tie up everything. So the Mofasilite was first published in um, August 1845 and continued publishing um, for almost a decade even after his death in um, 1864. Um, uh, it's a very interesting newspaper which was against most of the establishment newspapers of the day like the Delhi Gazette, the Hurakuru and um, others. And there's a constant back and forth of invectives between these newspapers in, in the editorials. Um, very interesting um, to see how newspapers function during that time. The front page of the 1845 newspapers uh, would often have literary pieces. And um, Lang's newspaper was fairly successful. Uh, there's a report in, uh, in the Sydney Bulletin in uh, <clears throat> 1850s um, that he made as much as um, um, 30,000 pounds a year of, of the newspaper, which is incredible um, for a subversive anti-establishment newspaper of the time. So his trick was simple. Uh, he included a lot of literature and this was the age of the rise of the novel where serialized novels were in um, vogue. So he would publish his own novels. Most of his novels are serialized in his newspaper apart from many other uh, famous writers of the time, including Charles Dickens. He also published short stories, poetry. Um, <clears throat> he himself um, translated the poetry of Sadi of Shiraz from Persian to English, which was also a huge draw. And so he had great facility in, in Persian and Urdu as well. We'll come to that when we talk about his uh, <clears throat> legal career. Or, or, or actually, they're all interwoven, so we have to talk about it uh, <clears throat> now also. Um, uh, Lang learned Latin in, in, uh, in his grammar school in, in Sydney and had a facility for languages clearly. And when he came to India, he had to learn Persian and Urdu fast to be able to practice in, in, in the lower courts. And um, um, Persian was still used uh, in, in the courts until early 20th century. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, it, it would sound rather odd um, to Indians that 100 years ago, Persian was still being used, a language that is sort of doesn't exist any longer except the script that is uh, nostalgic that is used for Urdu. Um, so anyway, um, he learned uh, these languages to also to be able to talk to people and include um, uh, in his pieces as a journalist. And uh, so the serialized novels, the primary audience of his was um, um, was the military wives, uh, the housewives of army men. And they were his primary constituency and they would, and their husbands would also give, give him a lot of gossip, and write letters to the editor talking about this or that matter in the military. And as well as he had access, personal access to a lot of these people. So he had a very inside knowledge of uh, <clears throat> the British Indian army and um, he would publish all that gossip and also his opinion pieces and uh, would lampoon the military. Um, and also his, his novels are uh, very sarcastic uh, uh, towards the military and, and, and so on. So for example, 
in the in the novel the weather bees uh, there is this uh, incident where a, a contingent is wiped off in the Ang anglo sikh war and the rule is the rule was that the wives of uh, army men would have to leave the barracks if their husbands died and so these wives always had a plan b and and they had uh, they had somebody in mind in case their husbands died and so all these uh, <clears throat> widows marry really quick after these people have died and all these people return they haven't died it was misreporting and then there is a brawl and uh, duels between the new husbands and the old husbands and um, and so lang uh, is very witty and sarcastic towards what was um, happening in the military he makes fun of the court marshals um, he makes fun of the ranks of uh, all the high military officials saying that um, they're not in their position because they have any talent uh, but because everybody died of cholera and malaria all all, all above them um, things like that so um, uh, having such deep inside knowledge of, of the military um, and he also spent a lot of time in, in um, Masuri and, and Shimla during the summer and Shimla was the summer capital and, and Masuri was, was the retreat and he also reported all the scandals um, that happened over there. So uh, and also talked about all the, uh, he was probably the only writer at that point of time to openly write about the love affairs between the British uh, army men and Indian women and uh, the illegitimate children thereof. Um, there are multiple stories, four or five, which, which talk about the fate of these children. Something which is picked up by um, uh, Rudyard uh, Kipling later on. And so this was his newspaper's model to publish these serialized novels with uh, the prime constituency was women. <clears throat> and therefore, his novels are also um, very women oriented and also one could say proto-feminist, the term feminism didn't exist at that point of uh, uh, time. Um, but very interesting when we come to his, his career as a writer, we'll get to that. And so his newspaper was very successful um, and being a lawyer himself, um, he knew the inside story of, of the judiciary, of the legal system very well and which also is, is um, very good documentation and gives us insight into the history of, uh, of the legal system in India and in, in British Empire, or why certain things are so important. So for example, one of the most important day-to-day um, -day idioms in uh, India still is, I'll give it to you in writing, or maybe in other parts of the world as well. Uh, in Hindi, it, it is, Likke de dunga, yeah, Likke de dunga, I'll, I'll give it to you in writing. And so he throws light upon why giving it in writing is uh, so important because uh, the British judges considered uh, the native witnesses um, hostile uh, and they thought that they could be bought for a bottle of alcohol or, or a few rupees and uh, they would often turn their statements around is what most of the British writers at that time write and therefore they decided to have everything written down and Lang says not that it mattered at all um, because you, you just had to get their thumb impressions because they were illiterate. And so the hostility is now from the other side. Uh, you could write anything in, in, and get the thumb imprinted on that. And so he says these reams and reams of um, paper um, wasted over nothing um, because of, of the assumptions that the native witness is, is hostile. And um, another thing that, that we also see is uh, um, character certificates or uh, letters of uh, reference um, that, that are still used. And um, character certificate, certificates was, were used in India until 10 years ago, maybe even now, um, in some places for admission to colleges amongst other documents. And Lang talks about the character certificate. I always wondered what, what the business of character certificate is that you go to a notary and they certify your character um, as Victorian as it gets. So Lang uh, was uh, uh, in one of the accounts, 
uh, he talks about traveling to um, uh, Nana Sahib. Um, and we'll come to a, a, an interesting Nana Sahib story in just a minute. Um, Nana Sahib, uh, the, one of the prime warriors of the 1857 War of Independence or the Great Mutiny, as you would like it. Um, and, um, and he had access to a lot of royalty, uh, just being himself, just, just being the white man, let's say. Um, so he would not introduce himself. He says, I would not introduce myself as a civil servant or, um, or a military person. And uh, so he calls himself an interloper all the time. Mofisilite and interloper are his two sort of pseudonyms that he um, constantly uses. So he would just show up at anybody's royal palace and he would be welcomed and would get great hospitality for a few days. So at Nana Saib's place, he was, as he says, shampooed for a week which is um, um, uh, the word shampoo has changed its meaning. The word in Hindi was champi, which is massaging. And uh, the British couldn't pronounce it, so they called it shampoo. And the meaning of the word shampoo has changed much, much like uh, uh, the meaning of saloon has changed. Um, uh, right. So, he, and then uh, he said Nana Sahib was very fond of the good life and he had European um, carpets and chandeliers and things brought from all over the world, etc. And he was fond of his good wine, um, etc. At the end of the week, he had a character certificate written out by John Lamb, a, a local powerful feudal lord, getting a character certificate written. And uh, apparently Nana Sahib had 150 such character certificates already written by um, different Firangi personages. Firangi was the term that was used for uh, <clears throat> um, for anyone um, European at that point of time in India. So um, uh, all this information is really uh, interesting. Uh, showed Lang's general career and and also as 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 a uh, journalist. A couple of other important uh, and very interesting. Uh, incidents of, of Lang as a journalist. So once he was um, summoned by Lord Harding, the Lord Harding asked him as to uh, why he wrote so much against him. And Lang asked him if Lord Harding had come to India to make money, to which Lord Harding says, of course, I'm a poor man. And Lang said, if your Lordship is, is a poor man, being um, a Lord, um, I sure am way poorer than you being, being from convict uh, origin in Australia. And I have a right to earn money much more than um, you would have. Uh, and so I make much more money by criticizing your lordship than I can ever do by praising you. Lord Harding was happy, invited him to be a state guest in Shimla and, and so on and so forth, but gives a glimpse into um, how uh, caustic and funny um, uh, Lang could be. Another very interesting incident is when um, uh, uh, the police uh, burned down a village in upper provinces in pursuit of a criminal. The village wouldn't give up the criminal and, and they burned down the village. And uh, no English newspaper was willing to publish it. And Lang also knew that he would get into trouble if he published it in his newspaper because there's some very influential people involved in it. So what he did uh, is that he wrote it out in Urdu and the printer was the same for his newspaper and the Urdu newspaper Jami Jamshid and he dropped it over there and it got printed uh, in the Urdu Akbar Jami Jamshid. And how do we know about it? He also liked to boast about his, uh, his um, um, the things that he did of, of this sort. And so he writes a short story um, later in which he says there's this rogue British journalist um, who does not have a sense of propriety and um, who shakes the status quo and he wrote, he knew Urdu and he wrote uh, this piece in Urdu and dropped it at the, at the printer, uh, which was the same for the English and the Hindi Urdu newspaper. And so these uh, were the kind of uh, um, things that, that he did as a journalist. And despite the fact that he was very abrasive toward the establishment, like I said, he was um, a very successful journalist 
curtsy mostly the army housewives and also managed to make a lot of money and uh, by and it circulated well very well within the army even though he criticized the army um, <clears throat> because of all the gossip and the scandals that were also published uh, in his newspaper so that's roughly his career as um, as a journalist um, as a lawyer um, uh, he was the lawyer of rani of jhansi for the doctrine of laps case Uh, which he lost very quickly. Why he lost it quickly lies in a previous case he had fought um, for one Lala Jyoti Prasad. Lala Jyoti Prasad was a commiss commissariat um, contractor for the British in the Anglo Sikh Wars, 1840-1845, and uh, instead of you know, paying him up, uh, they slapped a case of um, forgery against him, and Lang was the guarantor, and some of Lang's possessions were taken. So. it is suggested in lang's writing that uh, the police took away his overcoat and his umbrella and that is what outraged him the most so he was in england he came back to that is contestable as i've suggested in my book lang may well have been in india and made the story up of uh, being in england um, but anyway the official version goes as follows what he said in the court is that he came back from england to fight uh, uh, lala jyoti prasad's um, case um in in meerut and for a week um he didn't um, say a word he just cooled his heels listening to the prosecution's argument and uh, lala jyoti prasad almost regretted having hired him he thought that he was just a uh, braggart who uh, who had met with some success but this case was too big for him after a week after lang had listened to the prosecution uh, he told prosecution uh, tore into the prosecution uh, very easily um it was an easy case for him because uh, there was nothing much that the prosecution had to allege he had lala jyoti prasad had wads of uh, <clears throat> invoices and receipts for 5 years and <clears throat> they had whatever irregularities uh, they had pointed out to lang was able to cover up for it pretty easily and so a night um, before the judgment was pronounced and this has been written by william forbes mitchell a soldier uh, from 1850s writing in 1893 and uh, he write he's writing about in 1893 because lang is so long since dead um, so uh, a day before the judgment was pronounced as william forbes mitchell says uh, there was a party and lang was no teeto totally he says john lang's favorite spirit was john exshaw so in abbreviated on john exshaw um his friends asked him what he thought of the jury and he said that the jury is a bunch of damned sewers pigs and um, so his friends um, asked him would you be able to say this in the court and he said of course i will the next day in the court um, uh, he said that he had come aboard the nile the ship nile from england and on the ship they served him rotten pork and the hind leg of which um, stank like the allegation of forgery made by um, such and such uh, the, 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 pro the prosecution the prosecutor uh, name and uh, then he went on uh, to point out issues raised raised by uh, several jury members and and compare that with some an anatomical part of the uh, rotten pork that was served um, aboard the nile and <clears throat> so he is so humiliated the jury that the judge advocate general in the end um, declared that he was ashamed to have been associated with the case so he had called everyone pig and won the case and the bet Lala Jyoti Prasad got thirty lakh rupees. Um, <clears throat> and just to uh, give thirty lakh is three million rupees. And just to give a perspective, uh, the ru rupee was uh, four dollars to a rupee in 1935. Um, and we are talking 1850. You can understand how uh, powerful the rupee was. Uh, it was more powerful than the pound at that point in time. So the uh, amount of money that the government owed Lala Jyoti Prasad. and lang got 10% of it or 
thousand uh, uh, rupees at that point of time, and Lala Jyoti Prasad also gifted him his uh, his portrait, um, gold bucketed portrait, which uh, Lang carried with himself um, all the time. So in 1857, Nana Sahib turned out to, to be the villain for the British um, relating to Kanpur massacre. He was uh, the king of um, Kanpur and uh, and the surrounding areas, and uh, women and children were also massacred in in the great mutiny of the war of independence. Whether or Nana Sahib's orders or not, uh, that is still very uh, debatable. However, Nana Sahib is is a sort of a prime hero. In the Indian historical imagination um, for the resistance that they put up against the empire, along with uh, the Rani of Jhansi. And we've already um, talked about his encounter with Nana Sahib. And so he was in England, and they were looking for a picture of Nana Sahib after the massacre happened. And nobody had seen Nana Sahib, no uh, British person had seen Nana Sahib. And so uh, uh, the journalists flocked to Lang in England to get a picture of Nana Sahib. And, there on the wall was Lala Jyoti Prasad's uh, picture. And so the journalist from Illustrated London News um, took this uh, picture along and Lang told him that um, this picture resembled Nana Sahib only as much as the journalist resembled the queen, but um, the journalist wouldn't listen and published it as, as Nana Sahib. So Lala Jyoti Prasad's picture got published as Nana Sahib. Now there are various versions to this story. I'm just telling one version. Um, Lang may have wantonly given the picture uh, as a prank. And, and so after this, uh, Lala Jyoti Prasad, who had already been wanted twice, dead or alive, um, was again, his picture was up on the walls as dead or alive. And um, um, Lala Jyoti Prasad's followers were very happy that he looked like royalty. And Nana Sahib's followers were distraught that uh, uh, you know, he looked like a Marwadi banker with a pot belly and he did not look like the royal person that he was. And Lala Jyoti Prasad himself went into hiding. So it's a, <clears throat> a funny, one of those larrikin moments of um, one lag. And so he was highly celebrated as a lawyer in the upper provinces after this. And the Rani of Jhansi invited him um, to be his lawyer. Um, Unfortunately, she lost within a week because um, the East India Company was determined to uh, humiliate um, uh, John Lang uh, hereafter. And anyway, there was very little room for negotiation in the doctrine of lapse, which said that if you didn't have a natural heir, um, you would um, forfeit your kingdom. Meanwhile, Lang had called uh, uh, a certain jury member uh, a coward uh, in the proceedings, in the Lala Jyoti Prasad proceedings. Um, and he was sued for libel and thrown into jail in Calcutta for, for two months, from where also he ran um, another newspaper. And after he came back, uh, he kept running the Mofis Light. So that's his journalistic career. I'll quickly wind up in the, uh, in, in the next five minutes about Lang's uh, literary career, which, which I think is the most important of the three, because everything feeds into that. Um, he wanted to be a storyteller, so he himself is a character of, of many of his stories as an adventurer. And like I said, he had um, tall ambitions to be as famous as Dickens, and, and he thought legitimately so. There's also a description of a party in which um, uh, Lang and Dickens are both drinking together, and Dickens matches Lang tail for tail about India. And it's interesting that Dickens um, didn't, didn't go to India. Um, but uh, uh, Dickens was a working class uh, person, uh, so he didn't have any of the hangups that the gentry had. The gentry would not, gentlemen could not write for profit. And so whatever the gentlemen wrote went anonymous into household words and picnic papers, um, his, his Dickens's journals, and Lang also had to pretend that he's a gentleman because he had this great rage against uh, the gentry. And so it's only in the 1970s uh, that uh, Anne Lawley, um, uh, professor at uh, um, University of Hawaii, uh, got hold of uh, this accounts book of Charles Dickens. He kept uh, very meticulously kept uh, an account book um, in which 
33 stories are uh, attributed to John Lang. Some of them he republished in Wanderings in, uh, in his own Wanderings in India, but we know a lot more now. Um, and so actually a lot of what is attributed to Charles Dickens, not because he claimed them, but because he was the editor and, and the pieces are anonymous. So uh, like the monster becomes Frankenstein because he doesn't have a name. Um, and similarly, all these pieces are ascribed to Charles Dickens and people also think he spent a lot of time in India, um, but it is uh, mostly John Lang. Um, the other interesting thing is Rudyard Kipling's Kim, which I have argued uh, in, in my thesis that it uh, is highly influenced by two books, Francis uh, Marianne Crawford's Mr. Isaacs, um, which has uh, the meteoric rise of uh, a Turkish slave to becoming uh, <clears throat> And the most important um, uh, jewelry dealers in Shimla um, and uh, Lang's multiple stories about illegitimate children, uh, primarily black and blue, uh, from which Kim draws its plot. So Kim's first half about this uh, <clears throat> boy who's uh, born of Scottish parents, both dead, and then is, uh, is raised on the streets and so on. Uh, Lang has an exact similar story, and uh, and Lang died in 1864. Kipling's career is takes off 1880s. There's no way that um, Kipling did not know of John Lang. Kipling, in fact, acted in a John Lang play called uh, Plot and Passion, uh, which also <clears throat> John Lang had trouble with, as he had co-authored it with this person called Tom Taylor, who's notorious for having published 54 plays. He started his career at the age of 54. And uh, most of his plays are plagiarized from um, uh, French or Italian plays, but he had uh, original definitions of what is original and, and what is new and what is adapted. Uh, it's all very interesting. And, you know, so it was uh, initially uh, the play said co-authored by John Lang and Tom Taylor. It was, uh, Lang was more of a prose writer, so he took the help of Tom Taylor. But later, Tom Taylor um, only wrote uh, his name. Only uh, Tom Taylor was um, credited in the later versions of the play. So um, uh, Rudyard Kipling definitely knew very well of John Lang, because Lang was still a popular writer. It was just about 20, 30 years after uh, his death. And um, it's a death that's gone unacknowledged. And also very interesting that um, Lang's and uh, Rudyard Kipling's ideologies are in the opposite directions um, of this spectrum. An imperialist Kipling and a very anti-imperialist uh, uh, John Lang. Lang wrote about 24 novels. Um, like I said, he also translated poetry from Persian, wrote his own poetry as well, published various other authors in his uh, newspaper. And the hallmark of his uh, uh, novels is that they are fairly feminist. Like I said, the intended audience was women. So just to give an example, there's this uh, novel called Three Calendars or Jenny Dale. So all the uh, novels after the 19th century fashion have an alternative title, this or that. The Three Calendars is a spoof of uh, the standard Jane Austen um, novel, let's say Pride and Prejudice, where there are three girls and three, <clears throat> three men and they would meet in a ballroom. But here he says, when these three men dress in the calendar dress, which is uh, basically an anglicization of calendar, the word calendar, um, which is uh, which is a fakir. Uh, in, in, uh, and so these are military men who dressed as fakir for some reason and dressed as fakir and came to, uh, to the ballroom, which is also a complete parody of what a ballroom would look like. But when they dress as calendars, they all look alike. And so the eldest sister first falls in love with one of these men, but eventually falls in love with all the three because they all look alike when in the calendar dress. And um, so in a series of complicated maneuvers, he always sends one of his protagonists to India. So the main one is sent to Indian military, the second one she marries, and, and then he's killed off. Um, and third one is finally is reconciled, married to one of the younger sisters. So uh, he uh, sort of completely spoofs the, 
Jane Austen um, novel and other novels also uh, are pretty outrageous for the Victorian age of uh, <clears throat> uh, widowed woman living with a bachelor man uh, and, and so on and uh, so forth. So there's a lot in, uh, in the Lang lore and basically I've used him as a metaphor to or a lens to uh, look at uh, uh, mid 19th century uh, history and, and literature. Um, and so they, I think it's an alternative perspective uh, to look at these things because uh, uh, mainstream history is uh, uh, runs over these nuances or also ignores some of these uh, nuances and, and, and paints this, this time in, in rather broad strokes. So I think I can um, end at this point of time and um, as um, Professor Goldman would suggest, we take it from here. Thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Brendan. That's an extraordinary talk about a really fascinating uh, character. Not the least fascinating thing about him is nobody I know has ever heard of this uh, <laughs> character, an extraordinary uh, person. Thank you. So I'm wondering, um, were his writings or antics or activities reported on in the uh, metropolitan press, say in Britain or in Australia, outside of the whole sphere of uh, colonial India? Uh, can you repeat that, please? I, I can... Well, I'm wondering if, if, if this extraordinary character made an impression in the journalistic world in Britain on the one hand or Australia on the other, as apart from that you know, kind of hermetic uh, world of, of the, the uh, British Raj, so to speak. Oh, he, um, he did uh, create a tremendous impact. Uh, like I said, um, an Australian newspaper reported that he was such a wealthy uh, journalist based out of uh, India and Australian newspapers kept uh, talking about him. So on one, in one incident, <clears throat> apparently he, uh, there was some person who was unable to argue their case properly to a local king, and he decided to um, help them intercede on their behalf. And instead, that man uh, you know, lifted him and threw him into the <clears throat> into the audience. This was reported by an Australian newspaper. So it took me a while to find out what this incident was. It was apparently a, a man who owned a circus, a Frenchman, who was roaming around the world, and, and he came to India with his circus. And he didn't know either English or Hindi properly, and so Lang was trying to help him. And <clears throat> Uh, this man, this burly circus man, threw him into the um, audience. And in Britain, of course, he was a huge scandal. You know, they declared him a hospital bed novelist. Uh, <clears throat> and that did him uh, a lo lot of good, actually, because there's so many bad reviews that uh, people got interested in him as well. Um, but um, I forgot to um, uh, show the <clears throat> pictures. We can have a quick look at the at the pictures uh, uh, quickly in, in the next five minutes before we uh, have more discussion. Can you see uh, that? Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. So um, <clears throat> this is Alice Richmond's grave from where I, I began my talk, the girl who died in, in Pune of, of cholera and which began my uh, research about all things Australian. I can see the next one. Uh, this is one of the <clears throat> novels of John Lang, Captain McDonald or the Bailiff's Outfitted. And <clears throat> um, this uh, cover I've included to show how deeply entrenched uh, uh, um, anti-Jewish feeling was in, in Europe. The Bailiff's are obviously uh, uh, Jewish in all um, sort of novels of, of this time. And, and so Lang uh, also plays into that uh, stereotype. And uh, this is uh, the death certificate of uh, Lang. He died in India in 1864 um, uh, and died of uh, bronchitis. And while uh, he was dying, there was a party going on in his house and um, uh, Everybody was concerned about his Ill, Ill health. Nobody knew he would, he would die that very night. And he said the party should not be stopped on account of his Ill health. So the party went on and he um, died while the party was still on. He, he was in his bedroom. 
Uh, you can see the next one. And this is uh, very interesting. This is Fisher's Ghost, Ghost Festival in, in Campbelltown, Sydney, held in, in, on the first weekend of every November. And this is, I participated in, in the festival. Now, this is um, a story about um, <clears throat> George Boral in 1826, um, who was hanged <clears throat> uh, because apparently he had murdered his neighbor. His, his neighbor had given him uh, the power of attorney and gone back to England. Um, but his dead body was found uh, in a pond nearby and uh, apparently his neighbor had murdered him for the property and then tied him to a stone. And so John Lang, this was a famous story of, because there was a public hanging <clears throat> and there was a lot of interest in phrenology. So the bodies and, and the heads of, of the criminals were often used by uh, doctors at that point in time. John Lang added a ghost to the story that a ghost pointed to the pond and from where the body was exhumed and so on and so forth. And then um, uh, the story grew into a legend and uh, <clears throat> I've read uh, several documents about uh, the Campbelltown Ghost Festival but nobody uh, seems to really know about uh, John Lang and, and the story that he wrote courtesy of which this festival exists today. And this is not John Lang's handwriting, but but a lithograph. This is his first um, uh, first literary work. Um, and this is um, uh, John Lang's mother's grave in uh, Asheville Park, uh, Sydney. So this is a huge property they had, which is now broken down. And there also there's a Hare Krishna temple now. Um, <clears throat> And Lang never met his mother after he left for uh, India in 1896. Even when, when she died, he did not return. And there was some sort of animosity uh, <clears throat> because uh, he was a stepchild of his foster father. His mother remarried because his father had died before he was born. And there were many children in the family, around, I think, 14 children in the family. And so, uh, so there were issues. And so he never returned. You can see the next one. Um, this is um, John Lang's will, um, in which he gives everything to Margaret Wetter, um, who he remarried. He got divorced from his um, uh, first wife. And towards the end of his life, he ma married Margaret Wetter, with who also he had um, a son, who also I tried to track down, who was probably in the uh, British civil services in, in the early 20th century. And that is also the Campbell Town, the Fisher's Ghost Festival. <clears throat> um, and so there's all these pageantry. It's basically a children's festival in which children come to uh, enjoy and last several hours. And there are all kinds of hosts and, um, <clears throat> and this sort of pageantry. You can see the next one. And this is uh, uh, the story I was talking about where uh, Nana Sahib's picture, Jyoti, Lala Jyoti Prasad's picture got published as Nana Sahib. So as one can see, this, this man um, <clears throat> has a pot belly. So he's been adorned well to look like a royal personage, but other representations of Nana Sahib show him much leaner and fitter than this, this person and, and, and the resemblances to Jyoti Prasad. And this is something I put together very painstakingly. Um, uh, this is a side project I did, and it's in the uh, book as well, of, of forming the <clears throat> um, family tree. And very interestingly, um, after uh, uh, his wife, uh, Lucy, went back to England after having divorced him, first they were separated for a long time. Um, his daughters both got married into um, Italian nobility. Uh, <clears throat> And so one of the daughters uh, was also a writer and, and she wrote an authoritative text on Luca de la Robbia. And um, the other one, I was able to, Amy Lang, uh, uh, I was able to trace her family line on her husband's side until um, today's day. And I met Princess Monique Riccardi Cubitt, who is from that uh, family and, and so on and so forth. Let's see the next one. That is John Lang's self-portrait of himself with Nana Sahib. And as, as one can see, Nana Sahib here looks uh, different. 
um, from that picture, he's leaner, uh, darker, has a different look, though, though it's a very small um, uh, sketch. It's, it's difficult to compare it with, with that one, and still one can make out uh, the diff uh, difference. And that is uh, John Lang's mother, Elizabeth Lamb. <clears throat> one of the portraits I got from Ashfield Park. And this is one uh, from the local historical society in Sydney. I, I got this picture of what uh, John Lang's house looked like um, in the 1860s. Right. And that's uh, a book um, by one of Lang's descendants. Um, in which uh, this illustration is made of what the house looked like in the 1870s. And this is Lang's grave, which I've never been able to um, find. I've been to the Camel's Back Cemetery in Masuri several times. I've been told where the grave is. Many people know about it, but I somehow am unable to find it, and I'm happy not to ever find it. I think um, that's the, the, okay. This is um, uh, from Too Clever by Half, one of the illustrations. The Lang illustrated his novel Seventy and all uh, illustrated by him. So this is treating um, uh, a dog with a mercury medicine. It's very interesting. The interesting interest in mercury medicine, apart from interest in various things like uh, cure for cholera with ice and, and so on and so forth. There's a very interesting Wilkie Collins novel, which I'm forgetting at the moment the title of it, but which is Wilkie Collins also took a lot from Lang and also Lang's penchant for sort of um, writing against uh, racism of, of the time. So in the plot of that novel, the name of which uh, will come to my mind in a bit, or maybe not, um, the, uh, there's a blind girl a uh, blind British girl who falls in love with a guy, another British guy, white guy. And uh, <clears throat> he goes um, to a war and his leg has to be amputated. Uh, till there, it's fine. Um, but he has to be treated with a mercury medicine, which turns him sable. Sable is the word for black in 19th century. So this guy turns black. And uh, the lady is blind from birth, so she does not really know what texture any color is. But when she hears that he has turned black, she loathes him, and the relationship runs into trouble. And, and so Wilkie Collins um, clearly is uh, um, working a snook at, um, at how racism operates, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Right. <clears throat> So I think is that the end of the uh, this that is uh, a newspaper and as you as we can see on, on the very um, front page there's um, a, a poem the newspaper begins with a poem which is uh, unthinkable of now <clears throat> even on the last page and this is uh, I don't remember if this poem is by um, uh, John Lang himself but he also included several other um, writers and this one is called Ocean sketches on the voyage of written on the voyage of india Let's see the next one and, and this is just to show different mastheads of um, uh, of the metro this is from 1851 uh, in which it uh, the nature of the newspaper changed and the front paper has um, uh, more advertisements and, and so on Mm. And this is uh, the cover page of, of the same um, thing that I showed initially, the lithograph, first lithograph published in 1835 when he was uh, uh, just 19 years old. And he's dedicated it to WTK. This is another representation of uh, um, Nana Sahib. And one can see how different it is from what got published as, as, as the authoritative picture in Illustrated London News. And this is um, something very interesting. Uh, so they used uh, this technique uh, of um, mirror lamp, 
to project uh, something from underneath the stage, a phantasm from underneath the stage to on, on the stage. As, as you can see, there's a stage and there are two people underneath the stage and there's a projector <clears throat> and a, a mirror that, that projects it on the stage, which has a glass screen. And so uh, ghosts could be presented like this on, on the stage. And Lang had all these curiosities, as did most uh, uh, people in, uh, in 19th century. So, however, there's this rumor in 1857 that uh, Akbar Badshah was parading, uh, came on his elephant on the streets of Agra, near the Agra fort, and declared that the uh, East India Company and the British would win the war and which uh, John Lang says is a mischief created by Lala Jyoti Prasad through Mirror Lang, which is a little uh, too much to imagine that on the street, Lala Jyoti Prasad would be able to erect a stage and, and then manage to get the phantasm of um, Akbar um, onto the road, which, uh, which, which is, is the stage, but still an interesting thought. Um, this is also um, one of the most interesting uh, and the longest novels of John Lang, Will He Marry Her? She'd rather be named Will She Marry Him because uh, Leonora asks uh, the protagonist Augustus Reckless to come to India and only then um, she would marry him. And it turns out that she is of mixed parentage with uh, her, her father is um, white and mother is Indian and she's dark. Um, <clears throat> And sable, as the sable is the word he uses for black all the time, and and uh, she has a twin sister who is uh, as dark as she is fair, and it's in a very complicated <clears throat> uh, plot. And uh, again, challenges uh, the standard views, not just challenges. He completely makes fun of all all the views of <coughs> um, race and color privilege at that time. And, uh, to move on. and this is the Kipling uh, uh, play, Kipling acting in Plot and Passion, this is a John Lang play. So he says in the in invitation, this is sent to uh, uh, friends of his, um, where he acted as the smartest. Uh, he doesn't describe it to John Lang, he describes it to Tom Taylor. And this is the next page of, of just that um, invite. And this is very interesting. This is what I conjecture is John Lang's son, uh, the boy um, holding the um, eagle symbol um, in his hand. And he also played the bugle. Um, and yeah, for this, uh, there's a whole chapter about this in the book. I wouldn't want to go into this in, in details right now. That's Andrew Thomas Sturton Peterson, who is um, John Lang's brother-in-law, the judge at uh, Calcutta Supreme Court. And um, he also had uh, diverse interests. He built, um, he had interest in cholera research um, and, and spiritualism, um, which is basically planchet in, in today's parlance. And he, also had an interest in concrete. So he thought concrete is the future. And he built the Sway Tower in England, um, which is 218 feet tall, without any reinforcements of any girders or, um, uh, or pillars. It's, it's all cement. And ATTP is very right. The whole world is concrete now. And see the next one. But I think that's the last one. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. Kamil. Well, thank you for the uh, extraordinary picture show. And again, uh, before we get to the uh, questions of our guests, I, just to follow up on my previous question, I, I understand that why a person like John Lang would have been, been a kind of scandalous figure uh, at the time in among the establishment in Britain and so on. Oh. But were, were there not some, uh, should we say, liberals or anti-colonialist issues who took a different view of him? Uh, as a kind of uh, admirable figure? Sure, he was very popular, like I said, um, um, and as an anti-establishment figure. So like I said, his, um, his audiences, uh, mostly the housewives loved him and, and his <laughs> newspapers sold like hotcakes. 
but even in the literary circles um, he had uh, lots of allies so charles dickens's friendship was because their world view was uh, similar because they thought that the establishment is <clears throat> punishes the poor and um, there's also henry george keen a journalist in england who was a close friend of his and francis marion crawford like i mentioned uh, <clears throat> the italian american novelist uh, also wrote in a very similar vein like him so there and his brother in law andrew thomas sturton peterson jyoti lala jyoti prasad himself was, was very influential at that point of time and many of these indian no royalty were very uh, close to him and um, and also a, a lot of poor people that he describes um, uh, <clears throat> he gets he spends time with them lives in their houses all kinds of things so he was a very well loved figure um, and also a very uh, like i said there's a party at his house while he was dying so it's very popular and always had people around him and so on so forth so thank you very much uh, let's get on to the questions that have been submitted so far my first question is from ritu marwa and she mm -hmm. writes in the east and west is there still a difference in the value of a verbal promise zuban de di character mm -hmm. certificate is needed for getting a green card in the us i had to go to every city place i had lived in and get a certificate from the police station of good certificate kolaba police station had no way of saying whether i was good girl two tear emojis do you think the written word still has more value than a verbal promise in the western culture um sure the answer is um, yes i guess because um, uh, everything is still written down and and, and recorded um, in writing and what is written is the most important and verbal isn't given that much uh, importance and of course you mentioned uh, zuban de di in indian culture that where somebody has given their word uh, they don't go back on it but um but the, but that's suspect there's where it comes from the the feudal uh, lords of india uh, they have this uh, whole myth of zuban dena but i don't think anybody ever kept their zuban <laughs> their word nobody ever keeps their written promises either uh, <clears throat> it's uh, <clears throat> but of course bureaucracy loves its um, its paper work because it's self referential and creates work for them legitimizes them so short right now we have a comment or a question from uh, tipu pur kayasta uh sure. saying loving this talk it's a good companion work to ram guha's new book rebels against the raj have you comment on that or um i haven't read uh, ram guha's um, rebels against the raj but like like i was just telling the uh, the many figures like uh, john lang he's not a lone ranger he's not not a freak of of destiny at that time he's is definitely a unique character but it is not lone ranger <clears throat> and the, the picture is very interesting but a bit too small um, can they be shared later with the attendees um I yes uh, yes the the entire event is being recorded and uh, will be available uh, shortly to uh, anyone who wants to view it which will include the screen share right puneeta yeah. um yes i don't see further questions so um thank our uh, our learned speaker and the questioners and um all the questions too will be uh, shared in the recording um I'd also like in closing to thank the following people and organizations of course first of all uh, with great gratitude to professor uh, ranjan for this fascinating really fascinating talk about something I frankly never heard about uh, mm -hmm. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsor the institute for south asia studies and the sera kailat chair of india studies as well as the center on contemporary india um and with that i'd like to uh, once more express our gratitude to the uh, learned speaker and the session will be closed punita back to you thank you so much